You're listening to The Drag. The sun hasn't completely risen over Rancho Santa Elena yet. It's around 6 a.m. on April 10th, 1989. The ranch is normally quiet, but on this day, it's buzzing with law enforcement from Mexico and the United States, and several suspects from the Hernandez drug gang. Among them is Serafin Hernandez. He's the one who led police to Rancho Santa Elena the day he blew past the police roadblock. The police have spent the past few days intensely interrogating him. Here's George Cavito, the Texas investigator who's helping with the case. He started telling us I didn't have anything to do with anything and all this. And, and, and you know, I, I was there because he made me be there and all this. Police believe that Mark Kerroy's body is definitely somewhere on the ranch. But this ranch is pretty big. It's at least a few acres. So they're not even sure where to look or even start. Someone throws Serafina's shovel and officers tell him to start digging. As the Mexican sun beams on Serafine's back, he starts to dig, and dig, and dig. He's been digging for what feels like forever. He pushes away layer after layer of soil and rocks, but then he just stops. And there is Mark Kilroy. And as soon as I saw Mark there in the grave, there was no doubt it was him. I mean, what really struck his, his, we had his dental records, but you could just see right away where he had had some work done and it matched just like that. They noticed the condition his body's in. What you're going to hear next is investigators describing a brutal murder. If you don't want to hear that, you can skip ahead a few minutes. There was a certain amount of mutilation done to his body after his death. Uh, his legs were chopped off, thrown in. Uh, a portion of his uh, brains were taken out of his body. That was Oren Neck, the customs agent, speaking to the media after they found the bodies. Mark's body is mutilated so badly, investigators can't believe what they saw. Here's Gavito again. And then they, they ran a coat hanger two coat hangers through his spinal cord all the way through. And the wire, when we got to the ranch, was sticking up on the dirt. Mark's dad, Jim Carroy, writes in his book that the coat hanger sticking up from the ground is how Serafine knew exactly where Mark's body was. And after digging up Mark's grave, Serafine's not done. He tells Gavito. There's about 20 more bodies right here. What do you mean, 20 more bodies? See, there's one here, and you walk this through, and there's one there, and there's one there, and, and, oh, shit. Soon, investigators realize they're no longer standing on a ranch. They're standing on a mass grave. So they start digging. There's so much ground to cover, they even get other members of the Hernandez drug gang to dig too. Pictures from that day on the ranch show Sergio Martinez, a member of the gang, waist deep in one of the graves, digging. On this day, investigators find a total of 12 bodies, including Mark Kilroy's. By now, the ranch looks more like a construction site. There are piles of dirt everywhere and holes that sink several feet into the ground. For hours, all anyone can hear is the sound of shovels hitting the dirt. But the smell is unbearable. I watched some news footage from that day on the ranch, and everyone on the scene is reacting to the stench of decaying bodies. There isn't much audio from that footage, but you can just tell by their facial expressions that the scent is really awful. Some of them wear medical masks, and others cover their mouth and nose with their hands or random pieces of clothing. Anything to block the scent. The stench is what everyone remembers. Even after 33 years, it still haunts many members of the press, including Kevin Hargis, who was a reporter at the Daily Texan. 
the student newspaper at the University of Texas at Austin, where Mark was a student. I remember the, the just the visceral um, sen- uh, sensation of being out there and actually seeing it. And, and like I said, the smell. The smell really stuck with me. Um, I can remember that evening I didn't want to eat anything, which is unusual for me because I love to eat. But um, I just kind of felt nauseous the rest of the day. Medical examiners and police wrap the bodies in tarps and take them to a morgue in Matamoros. In a press conference after discovering the bodies, officials seem shell-shocked. They have a hard time even vocalizing what they've seen. Here's Alex Perez, who was the Cameron County Sheriff at the time. Horrible. The sight wasn't too, too good to see. It was, it was horrible. Like, just like a like, uh, human uh, slaughterhouse. Most of the bodies are in similar condition to Mark's. Mutilated. They were all sacrificed. Uh, a couple were shot. Uh, some of them were hit in the back of the head with machetes and uh, sledgehammers. As they uncover the details of the scene, investigators have so many questions. But the biggest questions are, why are all these bodies on Rancho Santa Elena? And who's behind it? All their questions lead back to that small shack, the one that Siva Varianathan found with the cauldron full of blood and bones. Ever since Mexican law enforcement first stepped foot on the ranch, It's been on the minds of everyone who saw it and smelled it. Now, almost a day after the initial discovery, it seems like whatever happened in that shack is key to understanding what happened to Mark Kilroy and the rest of the victims. On the day investigators found the cauldron, it was full of animal blood and bones and a human brain, Mark Kilroy's brain. They also found four other pots in the shack that held gold beads, American pennies, and the heads of decomposing goats. Law enforcement soon realizes this isn't just a series of drug-related killings. Before we get too far into this episode, I need to clarify something. You're going to hear me refer to the group sometimes as a gang and sometimes as a cult. You'll hear other people use those words interchangeably too. That's because at this point in the investigation, nobody's really sure what happened to Rancho Santa Elena. They know the Hernandez family is running a massive marijuana operation, but now they know there are bodies buried here too. And now, they're uncovering some evidence that leads investigators to think that there's something extra sinister going on here. The media begins to speculate that the Hernandez drug gang might actually be some kind of satanic cult. The press conference after finding the bodies doesn't make things any clearer. Here's customs agent Orin Neck speaking to a reporter in archival TV footage. And at the time of the arrest of the four individuals, they noticed a shack on the property that had some evidence of uh, satanic cult worshiping. When you're talking evidence, what are we talking about here? How do you know this is a satanic cult? Well, we have pictures, which we've shown to other news media here, where kettles full of uh, brains uh, in blood, human blood. I'm Jackie Ibarra, and this is Season 3 of Darkness. This is Episode 3. By the time investigators find the bodies at the ranch, they know what happened to Mark. They question Serafina Hernandez and other gang members for 36 hours. Here's what they learned about what happened the night Mark disappeared in Mexico. Serafine and some other members of the Hernandez gang were in Matamoros, too. They were on a mission. The leader of their gang is a man named Adolfo Constanzo. You'll hear more about him in the next episode. He told them they needed to kidnap someone and bring them to the ranch. But it couldn't just be a random person. 
According to our interviews with investigators, the gang members needed to pick someone who was young, in college, and white. Investigator George Cavito says the gang had their sights on another college student, but before they had the chance to grab him, the student walked away. They already had picked one, and they had another kid before Mark. But just when they were leaving and everything, that kid turned around and saw a girlfriend of his and everything and said, no, no, I'm not going to go with you guys. I'm going to stay here. Yeah, so they didn't kill him. After failing to grab that student, the gang was desperate to take someone else. They couldn't show up to the ranch empty-handed, and that's when they saw Mark. They followed Mark and his friends as they made their way out of the bar that night. They lurked closely behind Mark as he and his friends walked toward the border. They were there the whole time, watching and waiting for a moment where Mark was alone. They got him and they throw him in a car. They drive off. They drive off maybe two or three blocks and they all stop because they're waiting for the rest of them to come. They all get off. They're waiting. And as they're waiting there, Mark opens the door and takes off running. Mark barely makes it a block down the street before he stops running. And by then, Mark thought that there were police officers that had arrested him for, for being drunk. So that, that's what they had told him. So, but he took off running, and, and when he started to take off running, one of, the, one of the guys yelled, freeze! And this guy being an all-American, you know, the father, you do what police say, he stopped. If he wouldn't have stopped, he would have gotten out of there. Mark was the kind of guy who hardly got in trouble. So when he thought the police were the ones telling him to stop, he did. But these guys weren't the police. They grabbed Mark, tied him up, and threw him back in the car. They drove him to the ranch where they had the ranch's caretaker feed Mark some eggs and give him water. They kept him tied up under some trees farther out on the property. Jim writes in his book that Seraphine and the gang kept telling Mark they'd let him go, that he'd be home soon, and that everything was going to be fine. Jim writes that he thinks Mark must have believed them. Mark didn't know that much Spanish, so he wasn't entirely sure what was going on. He thought maybe the gang just wanted his family to pay a ransom, and then they'd let him go. But the time slowly ticked away, and by 2 o'clock that afternoon, he'd sat tied up and blindfolded on Rancho Santa Elena for 12 hours. The group wrapped Mark's head with duct tape so that he couldn't see or speak. They threw him back into the suburban and drove him to the shack in the middle of the ranch. Law enforcement believes they stripped off Mark's clothing and their own before they led him to the shack. He was still blindfolded. They made Mark stand in the middle of the shack on top of an orange tarp. Then, he was hit several times in the back of the head. They brought Mark out. They got a machete. I mean, you know, it's got to be the most horrible death that the guy ever had, you know. I mean, uh, his mother kept asking me, did he suffer? Uh, and, I, you know, it, it was hard to tell her no, because I saw the machete they used, and, I mean, they had to hack him, boom, boom, boom. I mean, you know, it, it was a horrible death. It was over in a matter of minutes. Mark Kilroy was dead. Now that investigators know what happened to Mark, Gavito knows it's time to tell the Kilroys that the search for Mark is over. He's worried that the news of bodies being put up at the ranch might leak before he gets the chance to talk to them. My biggest concern at that time was, it was kind of leaking out a little bit on the media, what we were doing out there, because the Mexican media was saying, hey, I think they found them kid. They didn't know about all the other bodies or anything. And my biggest concern was, I need to notify the parents. It's been four weeks since Mark disappeared. Jim had already gone back home to Santa Fe, Texas after weeks of pushing for answers and media attention. So I called uh, the, the office and I told our chief deputy, do me a favor, call Mr. Kilroy and tell him they need to 
fly down. When Jim gets the call that the police have found Mark, he doesn't really know what to think. He hopes they're calling because they found Mark alive, but part of him also knows it's been almost a month since Mark vanished, and police already requested Mark's dental records before this. Mark's mom, Helen, is also back home in Santa Fe. She's been organizing something called Mark Kilroy Awareness Days at the local high school to keep up the search efforts. When she gets the news about Mark, she starts packing up her suitcase. She's trying to be realistic. She knows the chances of Mark being found alive are slim, but just like she always does when she goes to Brownsville, she packs a fresh pair of clothes for Mark. Just in case. Cavito makes his way back to the sheriff's office in Brownsville to wait for the Kilroys. By the time he gets there, there's already a lot of media fans from different news organizations parked out front. And by then, they were already telling me at the sheriff's office, I mean, there's media from all over the place here. They're coming in from San Antonio. We already had like four trucks parked out in front, the huge, big uh, satellite trucks. City officials and law enforcement agents are already preparing for a news conference. But Gavita wants them to wait until he's had a chance to talk to the Kilroys. He really wants them to be the first people to know exactly what happened to Mark before the rest of the world finds out. The Kilroys are led to a small room. Gavito and Nick make their way to the room too, and when Gavito and Nick join them, Gavito finally tells them about Mark. I told him, hey, you know, this is what happened. I got him a rundown what, what had happened. You know, they had kidnapped him, how they had killed him. The Kilroys, of course, are devastated. Mark's younger brother, Keith, has tears streaming down his face. Jim and Helen cling to each other. As Nick and Gavito run through all the details of the kidnapping and the murder, the Kilroys still have so many questions. They ask, did he suffer? Have they caught the guys who did this? And why did this happen? Investigators have gotten to know the Kilroys pretty well over the past month. So it's hard for them to share the truth about what happened to Mark. But they have to. The Kilroys have just one more question to ask. And his mother asked me, my only concern is, did he have a chance to pray? I said, yes. He had, they, had him in a, they had him in a suburban there. And, uh, you know, he had a chance to pray. That's all I want to know. Now that the Kilroys know what happened to Mark, investigators prepare to share the news with the rest of the world. Remember, Mark's disappearance is featured on America's Most Wanted, so the news has traveled across the country. It's a national story, and the media has descended upon Brownsville, Texas. Gavito knows it's time for a press conference, but he also wants to give the Kilroys time to process the news of Mark's death. So he makes a plan. Gavito and his law enforcement colleagues set up several press conferences. The first one will take place in Brownsville, just outside the Cameron County Sheriff's Department. The press already knows about the bodies found on the ranch, and the swell of reporters around the Sheriff's Department is getting larger. They've got a bunch of questions, and Gavito finally has answers. By then, we have more names, more everything. We know what's happening. We can give them the name of the people that were arrested, Serafina Hernandez and all of them. They start telling the media all the details of the case, and investigators don't hold back. They tell the media everything, from how they arrested Serafine, to how Mark and the other bodies were found, even to how the ranch smelled. By the time the news gets to Brownsville residents, they're devastated too. No one could believe something so awful could happen in their backyard. Here's Monica Rodriguez Davis, whose family took in the Kilroys. And um, I remember getting out of school and my, you know, one of the coaches at school had said, hey, you need to go home because they found him. And um, I went home and that's when everything started kind of unraveling. Monica's house was essentially an unofficial headquarters for the search. They made flyers. They brainstormed how to get more attention on Mark's story. 
she's been involved since the very beginning. So by this point in the investigation, Monica's used to people stopping by her house all the time to help with the search for Mark. But today, people are showing up for a different reason. They're paying their respects. So I'm sure people all over Brownsville had already heard. Um, but, and then, you know, people just started coming over to the house, dropping off food. Typical, you know, uh, maybe not just a Hispanic thing, but an everyone thing. You know, people just kind of shower you with food when somebody passes. Um, and they just kind of showed up and there was just food coming all the time. Monica's had a front row seat to this investigation, but she's still shocked by what she sees on TV. I also remember them, and I don't know who them is, I guess the the chatter, the gossip, the chisme was that they how they found them on that ranch. And I was like, oh, they're... People are just sensationalizing this thing and making it bigger than it was. And when I found out that that was accurate, um, it was just, it almost was even worse, you know? It's just, oh, what a horrible, horrible thing to have to imagine about your child, you know? I mean, it's bad enough as it is, and then just, uh, I don't know. So I remember being angry about people kind of spreading rumors about that, and then being upset, learning that it wasn't a rumor. This case really shakes everyone in Brownsville to their core. This is not only a community with a big heart, but also a community driven by their Christian faith. And they can't believe this happened so close to their city. Here's Monsignor Nicolau, the priest who assisted in the search for Mark. I was very mad at the beginning, brother. I couldn't sleep because they came to me. The, the, the family, the members, or so the, communi- the community of Brownsville were counting on Father Nicolau. He said, Nicola, look, what are we going to do? What are we going to pray? And, uh, but on the other hand, he crushed my faith. He's angry that something like this could happen. He says when they first told him that Mark was missing, he knew that something had happened to Mark. Uh, Unfortunately, we have kidnapping in in, in Mexico. I know many people come in, pray for my son because my son has been kidnapped, or pray for my dad, or 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 pray for my my husband because they disappeared. But he didn't think it was something so evil. Well, I thought that maybe they are looking for money. Can do what they are looking for. No, they were worse. Like everyone else, Monsignor Nicolau is having a hard time processing what's happened. I told you earlier in this episode that you'd hear people and investigators refer to the group as a satanic cult. You have to remember, this is the 1980s, in the midst of the satanic panic. We'll talk more about that later, but when you consider the cultural time Monsignor was living in, combined with being a Catholic priest, you can see why he and so many others were afraid and confused by what happened in Brownsville and Matamoros that spring. But he also feels relieved that the Kiroi family got answers. And some type of closure. A thanking God that finally, after so many weeks and months, we found out what happened, and the bones who were in the in, in a ranch, verdad, destroyed, verdad. O sea que estaban todos en, en escondidos, pero we find out where were they. Finally, after processing everything, he goes back to doing what he knew always brought him comfort. He prays, and I pray for those who destroyed the body of Mark. Because they did not know what they are doing. They served the wrong God, the demon. The demon is darkness. Now that the news is out about Mark, investigators decide it's time to take the media to the scene of the crime. They drive to Rancho Santa Elena. Reporters from the U.S. are shocked that they'll be able to actually set foot on the ranch. It's pretty rare to go straight to a crime scene like this. 
Usually, journalists can only get so close to active crime scenes before they're stopped by yellow tape, but investigators want the press to see everything they saw. There are dozens of reporters headed to the ranch, but Kevin Hargis already knows what's out there. You heard from him earlier, he's the senior reporter for the Daily Texan, UT Austin's student-run newspaper. He had gone out to the ranch a few hours before the rest of the reporters did. I think I remember we were in the newsroom and we got the word that he had been killed by a cult down in Brownsville and well, actually in Matamoros, it was across the border. And basically you could just see jaws drop all around uh, the newsroom. Kevin's a senior and only a few weeks from graduating, but he's been following Mark's disappearance since March. He's been covering the crime beat at the Daily Texan for about two years now, but he's never seen anything like this. So we uh, got there. It was open, it was unguarded. You know, it was really kind of surprising that no one was around. Um, and we got a good look at all of the all of the things, the, the cauldron, the, the shack, the, the holes in the ground where the bodies have been dug up. Um, it's kind of a humid, warm day, morning, and um, I remember smelling the smell of decomp- decomposing bodies. Um, and I, I still remember that. I mean, that's a vivid memory for me still. He's kept up with Mark's disappearance, writing a few stories about what happened and talking to the Kerroys, but he never thought he'd be writing about something like this, especially not about a fellow student. And, you know, the last thing anyone would have ever guessed at the time was that he had been kidnapped by a a cult. Other members of the media do the same thing as Kevin when they arrive at the ranch. They walk around take pictures and videos of the cauldron and the weapons on the floor, and question investigators. After the press has time to absorb what happened, it's time to meet some of the people responsible for the crime. After their tour of the ranch, reporters were escorted to the Mexican Judicial Federal Police Building, where Comandante Juan Benitez would lead the second press conference of the day. On Wednesday, reporters from throughout America and Mexico got their first glimpse of 20-year-old Serafin Hernandez Rivera. Mexican police paraded him and three other men arrested for the religious cult and drug killings on the Santa Elena Ranch. The press conference with the Hernandez gang is total chaos. I watched the footage and there's a bunch of law enforcement agents, including George Cavito and Comandante Benitez, huddled on the balcony of a building. There's a sea of reporters on the ground, just below them, yelling out questions in English and Spanish. Someone yells for the crowd to quiet down. Then the comandante pushes each member of the gang up onto the ledge, one by one, starting with Serafina Hernandez. He stands on a box, only a couple inches away from the balcony ledge. A reporter yells, Why did you kill Mark Kilroy? Said a fiend, with his arms behind his back, handcuffed, and his back. They didn't kill him, but the one who killed him, they, they hit him with a, a machete. Said a fiend tells the reporters he was the one who spotted Mark before kidnapping him. He answers a few more questions about where he's from and how scared he is of Adolfo Constanzo. Said a fiend later tells reporters about his innocence. Did you participate in the human sacrifice? No, sir. I didn't. I mean, I, I was there, but I never, I never, I never killed nobody. I never participated in nothing. I mean, I participated, but I didn't kill nobody. Then, one by one, Comandante Benitez parades the other members of the gang. It's Elio Hernandez Rivera's turn. He's 22 and likes it a fiend, an American citizen. But when it's Elio's turn to take the stage. Comandante Benitez starts to unbutton Elio's shirt. He pulls it down, just enough to show the reporters the marks on Elio's shoulders and chest. Mexican police brought out murder suspect Elio Hernandez, who revealed the marks making him a member of a cult of death. 
The footage is a little hazy, but the camera zooms in on these sort of scars on Elio's body. Based on pictures I've seen, they kind of look like crosses. These marks look like he could have been branded with an iron. According to Jim's book, these markings are supposed to indicate that Elio is one of the top members of the gang. And that he had a right to kill. Comandante Benitez goes on to display other members of the gang to the public, including Sergio Martinez Salinas. He's a 23-year-old man from Matamoros, and he helped kidnap Mark. He also helped dig Mark's grave. One by one, each member of the gang tells the reporters what went down at the ranch that day. They explain that there's this dark magic that's behind their killings, and then they say that it's all because one man, their leader, Adolfo Constanzo, ordered the sacrifices. After the trip into Mexico, it's finally time for the press to hear from the Carolroys. It's dark out by the time the reporters make their way back to the Cameron County Courthouse in Brownsville. Leti Fernandez, the reporter at the CBS affiliate in Brownsville, was at the ranch and is among the pack of reporters waiting to hear from the Carolroys. She's just seen the ranch and the devastation of it all. She's been to other press conferences before, but the scale of this one feels bigger than anything she's covered. And it's this huge room. And I remember walking in there and, and there, I mean, there were just cameras everywhere. I mean, it was this, there had to have been at least 50 cameras. I mean, and reporters and people, it was crazy. People were shouting questions and anyway, and I thought, wow, this is a huge story. Letty and a bunch of other reporters from all over are squeezed into this room. There's hundreds of cameras and gears waiting. Then comes the moment. Gavito introduces Mark's family, Jim, Helen, and Mark's younger brother Keith to the crowd of reporters. It's silent now. After seeing everything at the ranch and questioning both investigators and the Hernandez gang, no one wants to make the Kiroys repeat details about what happened to their son. The family members sit side by side. Jim's wearing a suit and tie and his hair slicked back. He tells the reporters how thankful he is for the support and love his family has received from Brownsville residents. He praises Comandante Benitez and everyone in both Mexico and the United States for their prayers and help. Gavita remembers the moment. Mr. Kilroy got up and, and kind of gave a, a, everything that had happened. How he had come here, how the community, you know, how he loved this community, the way they all helped, and, you know, just went into the whole thing and the spiritual part of it that, you know, uh, uh, you know, all this happened and, and you know, the, what can we do? It's Helen's turn to speak. She's in a pink blouse, and pinned right next to her heart is a yellow ribbon. It reads, We miss you, Mark. Since Mark disappeared, yellow ribbons have been a symbol of support and hope for the Kilroys. In between the sounds of cameras clicking, she tells reporters, Now that, that we've found Mark, we know he's safe. We know he's with our Lord. That's... That's the thing that's, um, you know, been bothering us all these weeks is, is not knowing what has happened to Mark, you know, searching for him. We could have never stopped searching for him. And, and now, really, we're at peace uh, knowing that Mark is safe and are with our Lord. And now it's just a matter of, of all of us. Um. She pauses for just a second. Then she says, with a soft smile, We're going to miss him a lot. After the Kiroi speak, Cavito takes questions from reporters. So I said, okay, take it easy, guys. Any questions? 400 reporters. One question. Do you forgive them? They asked her, a guy from CBS, do you forgive these people? It's a hard question to answer, considering what happened to her son. 
But Helen doesn't think twice about her answer. I forgive him. God forgives him. You know, we're Catholics we're to, to forgive. She also tells reporters that she's praying for the people who did this to Mark. They just must be possessed by the devil. There's, that would be the only explanation for such a, a bizarre and, um, you know, for what they did. Um, I pray for all of them, you know, that, um, that they can come to realize um, how wrong all this is. Everyone I've spoken to for this podcast says they still remember feeling amazed by the Kiroi's forgiveness. It stands out 33 years later for Leti Fernandez, one of the reporters at the scene. I mean, they were devastated, but at the same time, they were talking about what was next for them and to remember Mark. And um, and then, so there's that tie-in. I mean, they were so t- connected to their, to their religious Catholic faith. My grandma remembers this about the Kiroi's, too. I wasn't born yet, and my mom was about 16 years old. Ama wasn't anywhere near Brownsville, but she watched the story unfold on TV. And like any Mexican grandma, obsessed over the details, even if it was so far away. When I told Ama I was working on this story, one of the first things she told me was that she remembers seeing Helen on TV. From her blocky 80s-style TV in San Antonio, over 275 miles away from where the press conference was happening, Amma watched Helen forgive the killers. Amma is a devout Catholic. She prays. She wishes that God blesses me every time we part ways and gets mad when my family doesn't carry a rosary around. But even she was shocked by their ability to forgive so quickly. After the press conferences and as the details come out about what the reporters have seen and heard, The story is everywhere. Details of the crime are in almost every newspaper in both English and Spanish, and footage from the ranch circulates on broadcast news channels. Here's Leti, the journalist again. I remember my sister calling me from Hawaii, and she says, oh, I just saw you on TV. I saw your interview on TV. And and then that's when I thought, oh my God, this is like a really big story. Jim's book says there was even press from Tokyo in Brownsville reporting on what happened. And almost every headline or story or even conversation about the case, one word was used to group the gang together. Satanist. The cult, quote unquote, was characterized as a satanic cult, and it just, it wasn't. Um, you know, it should have been reported about where this book, this, this hodgepodge of beliefs um, from, you know, uh, uh, certain parts of Africa and Cuba and Puerto Rico. Right. Um, those were just cobb- those were not uncommon beliefs or religious beliefs. But, you know, he took them and mashed them all together and made this you know very specific thing to to the to the gang. That's Dr. Joshua Gunn. He's a professor of communication studies, and he also teaches classes in the Department of Rhetoric and Writing at the University of Texas at Austin. He teaches all kinds of interesting classes at UT, like the rhetoric of horror movies, and he also happens to be an expert in the occult. Cult or or cultism um, is simply the study of secret knowledge, and that knowledge tends to be supernatural or spiritual in character and occultism often concerns spirituality and magic and like psychic phenomenon, right? That's in general what we're talking about. It's a pretty interesting thing to study, which works out because Dr. Gunn is an interesting man. When I interviewed him online, he was in his home office, which has an extensive collection of lava lamps, but not the small ones you might see at a kid's store. These are kind of tall. His former students remember him for his really long curly hair and his infamous beard that's sort of shaped like a handlebar. He kind of looks like the bad guy in an old-timey movie. Dr. Gunn remembers hearing about the case on the news when he was a teenager, and like the rest of the world, was terrified that people could do something like this. It was really easy for Dr. Gunn and everyone else at the time to believe it was a satanic cult. 
The satanic panic was still raging in the United States in 1989, so even the slightest rumor of satanic worship spread like wildfire. It could be traced back to the 70s and the deliverance movement, which is a offshoot of Pentecostalism who believed in demonic possession. Um, and that sort of evolved to uh, a rumor panic about Satanism in the 80s, fueled by a Geraldo special on TV that aired right before Halloween um, on the Satanic Underground. And so people were coming out and claiming that there were these Satanic cults um, and that they were they were uh, everywhere. Um, you know, people were coming on talk shows saying that they were actually born um, to breed babies for Satanic sacrifices. Many people across the country were terrified that the devil was living next door or trying to steal their children. So it's not hard to see why the press immediately jumped on referring to the Hernandez gang as devil worshippers. I think the, the satanic panic is kind of central to this story because that's the frame with which journalists took up the story, right? So if we weren't in the middle of a satanic panic, the story may, might be drugs, right? Because this is really about drugs, right? Um, that's why the cult existed in the first place, um, was to smuggle drugs and to make money. So, I mean, that's really the story and should be the lead of the story. But because it came out in the middle of this widespread panic where people on both sides of the border believed in malevolent spirits and possessions, right, it was that much more powerful, all right, of a, of a story. Because in this case, there is a smoking gun, right, or a, or a smoking machete, if you will. There are dead bodies. And, they're, you know, as you say, they're still finding them. So that really gets inflames, right, catalyzes people's fear of the demon in darkness. But Dr. Gunn says these people weren't exactly Satanist. The first form of Satanism um, is um, a, a religion of basically uh, uh, um, um, self-celebration. I would say it's closer to Ayn Rand's objectivism in terms of it celebrates the virtues of selfishness and it's okay to have bad feelings. Um, and these kinds of Satanists are really atheists. They don't believe in an actual Satan. Um, they take the figure from Christianity as kind of a middle finger um, to mainstream religious beliefs, right? Then there's what he calls the true believers. There is uh, another kind of Satanism, um, which are true believers. Um, and to my knowledge, the the largest, the oldest one in the United States is called the Temple of Set, where they do worship some sort of dark force. I mean, that's the... There are very minimal numbers of those folks. And more recently, there's... And then there's the, the more recent Satanic Temple, which is actually a political activist organization, uh, mainly, um, mainly fighting um, uh, freedom of speech uh, overreach laws um, and, um, you, know, uh, you know, defending abortion rights and that sort of thing in the name of Satan as a way to sort of offend... Um, mainly Christian politicians and activists that, that, um, that are trying to get in our schools and that sort of thing. But out of the three kinds of Satanist, none of them do what Adolfo Constanzo and his gang did on Rancho Santa Elena. You know, like three kinds of groups, but none of them practice like putting dead bodies into, um, into a, into an iron pot, right? Like, you know, Two of the three are not really believing in the supernatural. So they just believe in the, the, a secular, the power of the human, um, you know, very secular. Dr. Gunn says this information was just really easy to spread back then because it played into the satanic panic narrative that was already sweeping the nation. As the stories pile up about the cult, a name keeps circulating along the headlines, especially within the Mexican press. Sara Adrete. In the months that I spent researching this case, I came across dozens of articles about Sara Adrete, calling her the devil's concubine, the devil's incubator, the high priestess, a witch, the devil's lover, to name a few. Her name and face were plastered everywhere. In Mexico, tabloids splattered her image with dark headlines. Right or wrong, people started to fear this girl from Matamoros. And soon, everyone would remember her name. Next, 
on season three of Darkness. She was a, a witch at night and a student during the day. I remember interviewing her parents and they lived across the river. It was right by the border. Elderly people in, and just, you just knew they were very sweet people anyway. But so we went to interview them and they were just, I remember how devastated they were that their daughter had been involved in this. This season of Darkness is reported, hosted, and produced by me, Jackie Barra. Katie Penchik-Alka and Robert Quickly are the executive producers. This podcast is presented by The Drag, a student-run audio production house at the University of Texas at Austin's Moody College of Communication. Sewa Olivares is the lead sound designer and editor for this season of Darkness, and the assistant editor is Heather Stewart. Special thanks to Marian Navarro for being the lead reporter on this story when this project first began. The associate producers are Emily Rubin, Megan Kirby, Jake Herman, Khadija Balde, Bethany Stork, and Miranda Vilches. The artwork was designed by Helen Halsey and Alexa Georgilos. Sofia Vargas Garam is the Drag's marketing and communications manager, and Grace Robertson is the Drag's PR manager. Christian McDonald is our technical director. Special thanks to Bob Buckaloo at KVU TV in Austin for all his time and effort finding archival footage for us to use in these episodes. And thanks to KVU for letting us use the audio. A huge thank you to Leslie Schrock for all her support and guidance. We also want to thank Jay Bernhardt, David Reif, Rachel Davis Mercy, Allison Dawson, and Kathleen Mabley of the Moody College of Communication. The Drag is a non-profit educational organization that is made possible by donors like you. Please support our work by going to thedragaudio.com slash donate. Every dollar goes directly to producing more content like this while giving students like me an amazing educational experience. Thank you.